Hey everyone, today's lecture is on elastic fluids. Um, be the second to last lecture. Tomorrow's will be on <coughs> compressible viscous fluids. So elastic fluids are compressible inviscid fluids. An elastic fluid, as the textbook says, is a homogeneous body. So it's all one type of material um, and it would have the same constitutive relation throughout. That's what homogeneous means. <coughs> Governed by constitutive equations giving free energy and stress in terms of the density alone. So we have that the free energy is equal to some scalar constitutive response function of rho, and the Cauchy stress <coughs> is a tensor, tensor valued constitutive response function. That's a function also of rho. So, since the density doesn't depend on the choice of reference configuration, the constitutive equations are themselves independent of the choice of reference configuration. So no matter what you pick the reference configuration as, uh, your density rho is always going to be the same thing. On the other hand, your deformation gradient depends on your choice of <coughs> reference configuration. So frame indifference on the Cauchy stress is going to require this. It requires that in the frame F star, the Cauchy stress look like the frame rotation times the Cauchy stress in the frame F <coughs> times the transpose of the frame rotation. Well, we also have that T star is equal to the constitutive response function um, of rho. And with the, we also know that t is equal to that because rho is the same. It doesn't depend on our frame. So that is equal to q t hat of rho Q transpose for all rotations Q. So this is going to require <coughs> that T be a spherical tensor, and we're going to kind of show that here. So consider the spectral decomposition of T star and T. So we have that T is equal to the sum I going from 1 to 3, <coughs> lambda I times GI, which is a unit eigenvector tensor product, 
gi. Well, we have that t star is equal to the sum i going from 1 to 3 <coughs> lambda i q g i tensor product q g i. <coughs> Well, for uh, those two to be equal, we're going to need the three eigenvalues to all be equal, since in general, Q acting on GI is not equal to GI. That's weird. So we'll say lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3 is defined as minus p. Since <coughs> q g i is not equal to g i in general. for any rotation q. So if all of the eigenvalues are the same, then the sum of the three gi tensor products gi when that's an orthonormal basis, <coughs> that's the identity. So we have that the Cauchy stress has to be a scalar multiple of the identity. Well, in that case, the internal power, T inner product D, is equal to minus P times the identity. Inner product D is equal to minus P trace D is equal to minus P div velocity. <clears throat> Balance of linear momentum reduces to this. Rho times the material time derivative of the velocity is equal to minus the spatial gradient of P, which we'll call the pressure, <clears throat> plus the conventional body force. <clears throat> and we're developing a purely mechanical theory here. We haven't really modeled the internal energy. We've modeled the free energy. So what we want to do is look at the free energy imbalance for a purely mechanical theory. <clears throat> is the density times the time derivative of the specific free energy minus the internal power <coughs> is equal to minus the dissipation is less than or equal to zero. Well, we can substitute in what we had for 
t inner product d. So we have rho psi dot plus p div v <coughs> is less than or equal to 0. We have balance of mass giving us rho dot is equal to minus rho div v. And so as a result, div v is equal to minus rho dot over rho. So we can substitute that into the above. And we have that rho psi dot minus p rho dot over rho <coughs> is equal to minus the dissipation. And that is less than or equal to 0. All right, since the free energy we said is a function of the density, its time derivative, material time derivative, is going to look like this. We're just going to use the chain rule. It's equal to the derivative of the constitutive response function with respect to the density times the time derivative of density. You can plug that in. And we have that rho d psi hat of rho d rho rho dot minus p hat of rho rho dot over rho is less than or equal to 0. <coughs> then we can multiply through by the density, which we know is strictly positive. So that's not a problem. And we can factor out the rho dot. We get rho dot times rho squared derivative of the free energy constitutive response function with respect to the density minus the pressure is less than or equal to 0. Uh, the textbook had a sign error here. They had negative the left-hand side. And I think that they still had it less than 0 from what I remember. Yeah, yeah, that's what they did. Um, so they should have had a greater than zero in the way that they had it. Um, it doesn't end up mattering because we're going to <coughs> prove that it equals zero in a hot minute here. All right, so they, um, in the textbook, they spend about a paragraph or two talking about how rho dot, um, the material time derivative of the density, is independent of the density. Um, and they do it in light of balance of mass. So, you know, they come up with a, a fancy, well, not particularly fancy, but they prove it. Um, but I would say, of course, that's the case because you can make a velocity field with any divergence that you want. Um, so you can get rho dot to be anything that you want for a given rho. Um, and so that's why rho dot and rho can be assigned arbitrary values provided rho is positive. Um, so because of that, and rho dot can be positive or negative, um, then what we have is that this whole thing in here has to be equal to 0. <coughs> Otherwise, it couldn't always be less than 0, right? If it was less than 0 for one value of this, we could pick rho dot to have the opposite sign. All right, so what we have then is that P of rho, the pressure, is equal to the density squared times the derivative of the free energy with respect to the density. Well, 
in that case, um, you know, this, this term that we have here, we can show that the free energy derivative is, or rather that the dissipation is zero. Yeah, because we, we have, yeah, right? So we just showed that this is always going to be zero, and that's equal to minus the dissipation. So there is no dissipation in an elastic fluid, at least for smooth motions. Um, if you have shock waves, then there can be some dissipation, but we aren't talking about that right now. All right, so as a result of that, the governing equations are rho dot plus rho div v is equal to 0, and rho v dot is equal to minus grad P plus the conventional body force, um, and then P is equal to P hat of rho. <coughs> All right, well, rho V dot is also equal to minus the derivative of p hat with respect to rho times grad rho plus b naught. And if you look in any spatial direction and time, then you'll find, well, let's uh, define one more quantity here. <coughs> alpha of rho equal to the square root d p hat of rho d rho. That's called the wave speed, or the speed of sound. And if the wave speed is greater than 0, for all densities, then the governing equations are a nonlinear hyperbolic system of equations in space, in you know, one spatial direction and time. And it's a set of equations that is <clears throat> particularly challenging to solve um, because if it has initially smooth solutions, they can grow into non-smooth solutions. Um, it's related to the compressible Euler equations, except that usually if we have compressible Euler equations, we'll make them thermally compressible. All right, if um, the conventional body force is conservative, which means that it's the gradient of a scale or potential, then we can do some cool stuff. We're going to derive Bernoulli's theorem.
B naught is equal to, we'll say, rho grad beta. So beta is called the potential of B naught. Then the governing, well, the balance of linear momentum is rho v dot is equal to minus grad p plus rho grad beta. We can divide through by the density. And then we can play with that grad p over rho term that is equal to minus the gradient of p over rho like that um, plus p grad 1 over rho plus grad beta. Mm -hmm. All right, so, oh yeah, this is V dot here. All right, so then V dot is equal to minus grad P over rho minus <coughs> the derivative of psi with respect to Rho. Come on. Times grad rho plus grad beta. So that last step came from, uh, let's see if we can find that here, right here. <coughs> All right, well, this here is equal to grad psi, since psi is a function solely of the density. So we have that the material time derivative of the velocity is equal to minus the gradient of psi, the free energy plus P over rho minus the potential. So V dot, the material time derivative of the velocity, is the gradient of a scalar field. So that means that uh, the curl of V dot is going to be zero. And what that means then is that if the velocity starts out irrotational, meaning that the curl of it is zero, then the curl of it is always going to be zero. And so it remains irrotational. All right, the free energy plus the pressure divided by the density is called the specific enthalpy. You hear that a lot in fluid dynamics, fluid mechanics. <clears throat> if the flow is steady, then for a fixed spatial point, 
the partial derivatives with respect to time of the density and velocity are zero. And so the material time derivative of v is just grad v acting on v. So grad v, v is equal to <clears throat> minus grad psi plus p over rho minus beta. If we let omega be the curl of the velocity, Then we have this grad v acting on v. Uh, you can show that that is equal to 1 half times the gradient of v magnitude squared plus omega cross v. And so then we have that, um, <clears throat> you know, this whole thing here. Is equal to this whole thing here. All right, let's define, eh, here we go, a function phi. It's a scalar field, and that's going to be <clears throat> psi plus p over rho plus 1 half magnitude v squared minus the potential. And so you could see that as the specific total energy of the field, if you want to think of it that, or like the specific stagnation energy. And so we have that um, omega cross V <clears throat> is equal to minus grad phi. So if the curl of the velocity is 0, omega is equal to 0, then grad phi is equal to 0. So if the flow is irrotational and omega is equal to 0 everywhere, then phi is constant. with uniform and constant. All right, so regardless of whether omega is 0, we know that v dot omega cross v is definitely equal to 0. Um, because omega cross v is going to be perpendicular to both omega and v. And that is equal to minus v dot grad phi. So v dot grad phi is equal to 0, which is going to tell us that phi is constant along streamlines, even when the flow is rotational for a steady flow. So we have phi prime is equal to 0. So phi dot 
is equal to v dot grad phi is equal to zero. <coughs> and phi does not vary following the flow. So phi dot equals zero is a statement of Bernoulli's theorem. Right, that's the one that uh, gives you the relationship between the pressure. For the incompressible, you would just have that p plus one half rho v squared is constant. Um, so this is the compressible version of that. And yeah, so what we have here is compressible inviscid flow. So on the next and final lecture, we'll talk about compressible viscous flow. And uh, the homework problem, the homework assignment, is basically going to be extending that to thermally conductive um, compressible viscous flow. All right, have a good one. Catch you later.